right. Um, trying to take a step back, um, maybe review where we've been the last few weeks and um, and prepare ourselves for kind of where we're going next. So um, where is it that we're going next? We're going to talk about maybe like the um, the most widely used, perhaps most important type of model used to um, to model time series type data. And that is what's referred to as an ARIMA model. Um, ARIMA model is, a, is an acronym. It stands for Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average, right? Which sounds like a lot of gibberish, but as we start developing the model, I, I think it'll start to make a little bit more sense to us kind of where this, this acronym is coming from. It's also sometimes referred to as a Box and Jenkins model, um, you know, named after the people that, that uh, invented or, or came up with this model. Um, right, our title slide says non-seasonal. To start with, we're going to keep it in a somewhat simplified context. Um, we're not going to worry about seasonality. And right, probably not um, surprisingly, we will, of course, in a, in a future week, I think probably two weeks from now, we'll talk about how to add seasonality um, into a Box Jenkins model or into an, uh, into an ARIMA model. So, right, recall, right, the, the very first week of class, we started off by trying to connect things to 512, right? Um, and we also gave like, a, like an overview of just kind of like, like, what is it that makes like a time series model, or, or rather, what is it that, that, that distinguishes the data to which we would apply a time series model from the data in which we would not. And the two, two kind of big things that we hit upon is we said that this data has a potential seasonality, right? This sort of seasonal repetition to our data. That's one thing that distinguishes time series data. The other thing is we said we might have dependency, right? That is, we might have some dependency in our data, right? In 512, we have the assumption of independence. That assumption is is not realistic in a lot of in a lot of situations where we're looking at observations over time. Right. So, so we talked about actually how to accommodate both these ideas the first week. We said. You could, right, kind of just using like, like uh, basic tools. We talked about you could um, potentially accommodate seasonality with dummy variables, right? That was kind of like our first um, first attempt at dealing with it. And we also talked about, um, right, dealing with dependency. We talked about how you can you can deal with dependency of the error terms by looking at positive and negative first order autocorrelation. Do you remember that? Um, wasn't that long ago. Right? We talked about, for example, the Durbin-Watson test. We went deeper into seasonality when we went to chapter seven, right? Chapter seven was our seasonal decomposition models. So our seasonal decomposition models, right, were, 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 were hyper-focused on, on this idea of modeling um, seasonality. How can we model it um, appropriately? How could we sort of remove it from our data set, which allows us to kind of smooth out our time series to allow us to, to, to determine, assess, and fit uh, maybe some underlying global trends. Speaking of, of trends, right, we then went on to chapter eight. We talked about exponential smoothing, and exponential smoothing allowed us to kind of deal with the situation where underlying trends, right, either seasonal or, um, or global, might change uh, over time. Now, moving forward, chapters 9 through 12, right, all of which are going to deal with ARIMA models, we're going to turn our attention back to trying to explicitly model situations where observations have dependency, right? We're going back to the idea because it makes sense to us when we're dealing with time series data that observations across time are dependent upon one another, right? The stock price today depends in some part to what the stock price was yesterday. The meerkat population today, right, depends in some, in some way, probably quite strongly, on what the meerkat population was yesterday. 
Yeah, here we go. All right. And oh. not just meerkats, gophers as well, right? Temperature, right, depends upon um, one another, populations do. Um, and right, even from like an epidemiological public health standpoint, right, we would expect the number of people with some sort of contagious ailment in a particular month to depend on those who might have had it last month, right? And more so, right, and we talked about this idea, I think, in our first week of class, we would expect that dependency to deteriorate to decrease over time, right? That is, gas prices today probably depend more heavily on what gas prices were, say, last month than what they were, say, 12 months ago. So um, when you have an ARIMA model, um, there's sort of three different models that we might consider. Um, one's called an autoregressive model, an AR model. Um, one's a moving average model, an MA model. So right there's uh, there's kind of we're getting a sense of where where this term ARIMA comes from, right? A R M A. I guess that's an ARMA model, and sometimes you do hear it referred to as an ARMA model. Um, so we might say, well, what's this I? Where does the I come from in ARIMA modeling? We'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that down the road. Um, and then you can actually have a mix. So you can have a, a model um, or a real life situation, a real life phenomenon that is best modeled by a, a mixture of these two, right? A mixture of an autoregressive and a moving average model. And so we call that a mixed model. So an autoregressive model of order P looks like this, right? And it's, I, th I think the of the two, uh, autoregressive moving average, probably the autoregressive is like the more, um, the more intuitive one, right? So we have this autoregressive model of order P and so that's basically saying that like the observation um, today, right? Say the stock price today, um, if, we, if it's of order P, right? I always think of like ARP. Um, isn't that like the, um, I don't know, some kind of professional organization of retired people or something along those lines? Um, so yeah, so ARP, autoregressive order P. Um, so, so the observation today depends on the observation yesterday and the day before that and the day before that and we keep going to um, to P time periods back right and of course that P could be any uh, whole number or integer so we model we model uh, the stock price today as a function of the stock price yesterday day before yesterday and so on um, and of course right it's, it's not going to be perfectly deterministic so we add this error term now, right, we've essentially sort of taken the dependency out of our error terms by, by putting them in our model. And so the leftover error terms should ideally be um, independent. Now, again, we don't have enough time to really get into it, but one way you can, you can test whether your model is sort of taking the, all of the dependency into account is to actually test to see whether those A's really are independent. But if you've modeled it correctly, they should be. If they're not independent, that's indicative of you modeling this thing incorrectly. So, I mean, this would be an autoregressive model of order one, right? Pretty straightforward. Actually, it looks a lot like what? It looks a lot like our um, our autocorrelation, right? Our first order autocorrelation. And that in that case, we were looking at errors, right? The error today is a function of the error yesterday. Here we're looking at the actual observation y's as being functions of previous observation y's. Right, and this would be an example of order two. All right, so this is this is p equals two. All right, nothing nothing too profound there. Just trying to write it out a little bit more explicitly. So yeah, so that covers uh, an autoregressive model. A moving average model of order q looks like this. So here we model the the stock price at time t um, not as a function of 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 the observations right the stock prices yesterday but the errors the error terms of previous time periods and and this one feels like a little less intuitive i, I think it is a little less intuitive um and, and it might also feel like very similar, right? Like, okay, well, isn't modeling it as like the errors of the time period yesterday 
kind of the same as um, as modeling it based off like the actual observation from yesterday. Um, and, and the answer is kind of yes and no. I mean, it's certainly right. It's obviously not exactly the same. Um, now, is it sort of related? And the answer is yes. In fact, you can show that you could re-express a moving average model as a as an autoregressive model. You could re-express an autoregressive model as a moving average model. So sure, right? They they are interrelated, absolutely. <clears throat> and again, if we had more depth, we can kind of explore this interrelatedness. But in practice, they're typically conceptualized as two distinct models. Now. Right, whether we use pluses or minuses is a little bit arbitrary. I mean, most linear equations, the convention is to use pluses. Um, again, there is a rationale for kind of why we're using minuses instead of pluses in this case. Um, but again, sadly, we, we don't have quite the time to get into it. So we'll just kind of take it in faith that the standard convention is to write these things as uh, the coefficients in this term as minuses instead of pluses. Here's like a here's like a nice little um so Chatfield's kind of like a it's like a big name in the time series uh, industry the time series field he writes a lot of books I think I think actually R is maybe his kind of um, preferred programming language when it comes to time series um, but but he writes right moving average processes have been used in many areas particularly econometrics. For example, economic indicators are affected by a variety of random events, right? So here we're looking at not as a function of, of previous indicators, but as a function of, of previous random events, right? These A's, not the Y's, such as strikes, government decisions, shortages of key materials, and so on. Such events will not only have an immediate effect, but may also affect economic indicators to a lesser extent in potentially several subsequent periods, right? So up to, I didn't emphasize this, but we use Q as the as the um, order of a moving average model, right? MAQ, so Q subsequent periods. All right, so again, I'll do an order one and right next slide will be an order two. So just to kind of show you what it looks like in a, this is Q equals one. And this is uh, Q equals two. Right, easy enough. So, when you're working with an ARIMA model, probably the single most important idea is this idea of something called stationarity. All of the methodologies for these models assumes that the Y sub T are stationary. And really how well your model works is heavily dictated by whether or not you have this stationarity. Now, for a set of Ys, for a set of observations to be stationary, they must have a common mean and a common variance. There's a little bit more to it, but that's the big picture idea. That is, right, the plot of the data should look centered, right, that's the idea of the common mean, with the same variability along a horizontal line. Now the reality is, right, very few time series look like a flat line with common variance. It's extremely rare that some kind of real life phenomenon is gonna look like that. Which means what? It means that almost always we have to take something that is not stationary and make it stationary. And there's sort of two pieces to that, right? One is how do I fix a non-constant mean? So non-constant means you have something that's like increasing, decreasing, right? Probably more realistically increasing at, at parts of your time series, decreasing at parts of your time series, but not flat. So how would I fix something like that? And the second thing we'll have to talk about is, well, what if the variance isn't constant? How do I fix that? But let's start with this idea of a non-constant a non mean, which means that you have some sort of trend, right? It's going up, it's going down, maybe a combination of the two. How do I fix it? The most common way of fixing trend is to take what's called the difference of the time series. That is, rather than working with y sub t, we work with some transformed variable, let's call it Z, where Z is defined as the difference 
of y sub t minus y sub t minus 1. So z sub t is basically, right, how much at every time point, how much did the, did the time series increase or decrease by? Right, we're no longer focusing on what, what's the stock price, but instead we're saying by how much did it go up or down? Often, taking one difference will be just fine, but there are certain situations where it's not, and in that situation we might try doing a difference yet again, right, a second time. And as you can, you can, you can keep doing this difference operator. Now it might seem like a little bit magical, like why why does taking a difference of observations fix trend? You can actually see it relatively easily. So so imagine that we have like a linear trend, right? That we have something the y sub t is just this linear function of time. So non-constant mean, right? Like if that beta one's positive, then right for large values of t, we expect y sub t to be larger. But what would it look like if I did y sub t minus y sub t minus 1? Well, I just, I just plugged in that equation to, to both y sub t and y sub t minus 1. So what happens? Well, the beta naughts cancel, agreed? And I probably, that's a mistake on my part, I probably should have put parentheses around the t minus 1, agreed? So I have beta one times t minus one. I can distribute that beta one through, right? And that'll give me beta one t minus beta one. And then, right, I go back, I distribute a minus. So, right, look at through, but hopefully we could see that that plus beta one t will cancel with a minus beta one t. And all we'll be left with is just a beta one. Pretty cool, right? So I can see very clearly how differencing, it's almost like taking a derivative a little bit, isn't it? Differencing, like basically, it's kind of, it ends up being like the derivative of that thing with respect to t is exactly what it ends up being, right? It ends up being just that beta one. And then I'll leave it to you if you want to, if you want to play around with it. If you want to actually draw what a quadratic equation, so add a beta two t squared and do You'll see that if you do one difference, it'll reduce that quadratic to a linear function. And then if you do a second difference, it'll then reduce that linear down to just this kind of uh, this kind of flat coefficient, this flat line. So again, kind of like derivatives, right? That is, if I if I take I take two derivatives of a quadratic to kind of get rid of the t. Yeah, pretty cool function, I think. Now, what about variability? Well, we're actually used to fixing violations of variability. Harkens back to our 512 days. In our 512 days, we just usually fixed um, right violations of uh, homoscedasticity by taking a log transformation, maybe a square root transformation, and that'll actually work just like before. So those are kind of the usual solutions to that problem. Okay, so. Um, given a data set or time series, um, there's now a, a number of things we would like to be able to test for. One, is it stationary? Two, is a moving average model appropriate? If so, what order, right? So, so first question is moving average appropriate? If it is, right, I have, what's the, what's the appropriate Q? Second question is, is an autoregressive model appropriate, right? If so, what's the appropriate or what's the P? And then I guess we also have that thing, right, is a mixed model appropriate, but we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, different people approach the stationarity thing in different ways. Um, statisticians really seem to or tend to prefer just looking at the scatter plot of the y's you look at the scatter plot of the y's and you say okay does the scatter plot look like it's a flat line with a constant variance econometricians right tend to like p-values tend to like statistical tests 
econometricians will use something that you may or may not have heard of called like a unit root test. There's lots of different versions of the unit root test um, to, to, to kind of test for stationarity. Statisticians prefer to, uh, to just kind of look at, a, look at the scatter plot. Now, to answer the question about a moving average model or an autoregressive model, well, we need it. We need a particular tool. And the main tool that we need is referred to as the sample autocorrelation function, um, often referred to as the SAC, right? Sample AC autocorrelation. Um, and also abbreviated R. Um, sub k. So r is our usual function of correlation. We'll see that k is the correlation of time points separated by k time points, or the correlation of observations separated by k time points. Yeah, I guess I have it in that second bullet point. The correlation between observations, yeah, separated, separated by k time units. So here's an example of an autocorrelation plot. It's on the left. Um, so, so what is this thing? So first off that, that bar, so first off, all of these are positive, but auto correlations can be negative. So, I mean, there's plenty of examples, right? Where you have kind of some bars on the right hand side. That is some of these things are positive. Some bars are on the left hand side. Some of them are negative. That's no big deal. It happens. It happens quite a bit. Um, the way SAS um, puts this together, this is actually from SAS, um, the way SAS puts this together, um, that bar for zero is essentially the correlation of observation with itself, right? Observation separated by zero time points is just itself. So that's actually perfectly correlated. That has a correlation of one. That's always the case. So that first bar is like, I guess, more of a reference bar than anything. Right, it kind of shows us what a bar of height one looks like, and then it gets interesting from one two. So, so when I'm going down that that um, when I'm looking along the left hand side and it's going zero one two three four five, right? That's basically the K. That's like right the correlation of of observations separated by that many time points. So when I look at that that one and I look at its bar, it's a little less than one, right? One of the cool things about this particular viewer, if I mouse over that bar, um, it'll tell me exactly what the number is for that. It didn't preserve with the with the um, screen paste, sadly. Um, but if you do mouse over, it will tell you that correlation. I mean, it looks really close to one, doesn't it? It looks like whatever, like 0.98. So what that's basically saying is the correlation between observations separated by one time point is 0.98. And then, right, we're seeing that the correlation between observations separated by two time points is a little less than that, maybe 0.95, right? And then like 0.93 and 0.90 and 0.85, right? It gets kind of slowly smaller and smaller. Now that little red line is essentially significance, right? So we can see that all of these things are significantly different than zero until we get to like number eight or so. Um, yeah. So again, this this literally is an actual correlation, like from Proc Core in 512. In fact, right in a time series class, I have people do some labs where they kind of prove this themselves. And right, if you have maybe some free time on your hand, I don't know, maybe you're quarantined for the next three months of your lives. I mean, you certainly could play around with it. Again, playing around with things, tinkering with things, again, it's really the best way to kind of get a sense and internalize how and why things work. But if we say that that, that, that correlation at, 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 at lag one is say like 0.98, that's basically saying that if say, say you paired an observation so you, you pair the observation at time point one with time point two. And you pair the observation at time point two with time point three. And you pair the observation of time point three with time point four. Right now we have these pairs of observations separated by one time point. And you ran prop core on it, you would get exactly that 0.98 or whatever, whatever that number is. 
If you do want to play around with it, the function that does that in SAS that you could use in a data step to help create these pairs is called the lag function, if you want to kind of Google it and play around with it. But anyways, that's the autocorrelation function. I think in a slide or two, I talk about this idea that we would expect a, 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 a diminishing um, correlation, right? That observations are related less and less and less the, the further back in time we go. We actually talked about this idea, I think, when we were talking about like positive autocorrelation. So this has like a perfectly diminishing pattern, right? So in that sense, it's very intuitive. I will say that this is in general a bad looking autocorrelation plot. So I, I, I said um, that typically we would, we would assess stationarity by looking at the scatter plot, but a secondary way of assessing it is to look at this autocorrelation plot. And we typically want this autocorrelation plot to die down very quickly. That is to get to zero or something that's not significantly different than zero, like very quickly by like lag two, three, somewhere in that range. The fact that this thing takes up to like, like lag eight is basically saying that the time series that I'm looking at is not stationary. Yeah, yeah. So if all the observations were independent, then we would expect that sample autocorrelation function um, to look like what? Yeah, exactly. We would we'd expect, and I don't, that's a typo, I guess. It, sh it shouldn't say autocorrelation function of the residuals. That's an autocorrelation function of the actual observations, not the residuals. I apologize for that typo. Um, but we would expect that thing, we would expect the autocorrelation function to basically just kind of be like just have bars of like roughly height zero, right? So kind of almost like have no bars at all. We would expect those autocorrelations to be zero if in fact the observations are independent of one another. I mentioned this, intuitively we expect to see a deteriorating dependence among, res I don't know why I keep using that word residuals, um, should be say amongst observations. Um, this means that we expect to see a deteriorating sample autocorrelation function of the observations. Silly me. Don't know why I had residuals on my mind. And I mentioned that before, we did see a deteriorating pattern, but again, for a stationary time series, we expect to see that thing deteriorate far faster than what we saw in, the, in, that, in that graph before. Now, Another tool that's used a lot is referred to as the sample partial autocorrelation function. You may or may not remember in 512, we did talk briefly about the idea of partial autocorrelation, right? It was the correlation equivalent to the partial F test, which probably you remember maybe a little bit more vividly. Notation wise, instead of R sub K, we call this R sub KK. And intuitively, it's the sample autocorrelation um, of observations separated by k time points with the effects of intervening observations eliminated. Right? That was that was what partial autocorrelation was in 512. Right? Partial autocorrelation was something like the correlation between a bear's weight and their length after controlling for right their neck girth, for example. And that's what we're doing here. We're just controlling for these intermediary time points. This is the same plot as before, just now I want to call your attention to, right, the leftmost plot is the autocorrelation plot. If you look at the middle one, the middle one is called the partial autocorrelation plot, so we can see what those are, right? That has, um, right, again, it's always going to be, it's always going to be one for that lag zero. And then we see it's very close to one for lag one. Then it drops quite a bit for lag two, and it's actually negative. So we have a negative autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation at lag two. And then it looks like it's kind of more or less zero, doesn't it? it looks like it flatlines. 
or pretty much the rest of the way. Nothing nothing crosses that red line, so nothing's really significantly different than zero. So those are all we would think of as more or less zero. And, and the rightmost plot, I mean, I guess while we have it up on our screen, that inverse autocorrelation plot, it is used here and there, um, but not nearly as widely used as these first two. We're going to focus entirely on the autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation plots. So what do we do with these things? Why do I care about them? Well, we're looking for patterns. And there's a lot of different patterns that we might observe and all these different patterns tell us different things. But the two main patterns we're looking for are these. And I'll tell you right now, it's not, it's not always obvious. In fact, it's often not obvious which of these two we're looking at. But we always try to break any autocorrelation and any partial autocorrelation plot into one of these two things, either dying down or cutting off. Right, so I actually have two, two examples right here in one slide. So, right, I mean, the autocorrelation plot is a very clear dying down pattern, right? It's a gradual reduction. It's never exactly zero, just getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So that autocorrelation plot is kind of like the perfect example of a dying down pattern. And the par partial autocorrelation plot is a, is a really good example of a cutting off, right? That is, it looks like it's, it's something other than zero at lag one, looks like it's probably something other than zero at lag two, and then it seems like it immediately cuts off to zero. Agreed? That is, it, it drops, it cuts off, right, from lag two to lag three. So the idea of like dying down and cutting off is almost kind of like, it's like conceptually, graphically, like a hill versus a cliff, right? The dying down is it looks kind of like a hill, right? The cutting off is it looks kind of like a cliff. Yeah, so I mentioned this actually. So, so one way to test for stationarity is to look at the SAC. The faster the SAC dies down or cuts off, the stronger the evidence of stationarity. Um, right, I also talked about, I, got a few, I guess there's a few things kind of embedded in this PowerPoint. Um, we could always do significance tests. I talked about those, those red lines indicating, right, whether or not something's significant. And then also, right, when anytime you're looking at these SACs or SPACs, right, those things go to like lag 20 or something, don't they? And so... Remember what it means for alpha to be 0.05, right? When you're looking at that red line and you're thinking of it as doing a significance test, right? An alpha of 0.05 is saying 5% of the time we falsely reject the null hypothesis. 5% of the time is one out of 20, right? So if I'm looking at like 20 different tests, if I'm looking at 20 different lags, I would, and, and none of them are significant, I would still expect to, Right, have this kind of this red herring, right? This, this, um, this false positive, and you'll see that a lot, right? You'll see like a bunch of bars that are about zero, and then some like weird spike at lag 13, and it's tempting to say like, oh, that's interesting, like why? What's going on at lag 13? But probably realistically, what's going on is well, I'm doing 20 tests one out of 20 of them is gonna be falsely significant. So that 13, like if there's no real reason to expect anything there, it's probably just a false positive. Now, how do we use the SAC and the SPAC? How do we use the SAC and SPAC to test which model is appropriate to use for a given time series? Well, we can show theoretically, it's actually not too, too hard. I think I do prove this in, in my time series class, um, that the true autocorrelation function will be zero, exactly zero, 
for all for all lags greater than Q. That is, it's non-zero, it's non-zero, it's non-zero, and then all of a sudden it's zero, right? And so we would expect the sample autocorrelation, which approximates that true autocorrelation, to look greater than zero, greater than zero, greater than zero, and then cut off be something very close to zero after lag Q. You could also prove that the true partial autocorrelation actually just converges to zero, but never quite gets there, so right, dies down. So a moving average model of order Q will have a sack that cuts off and a SPAC that dies down. We will see the autoregressive is the exact opposite of that. Right? An autoregressive model of order P cuts off after lag P. The SPAC, the SPAC cuts off after lag P and the SAC dies down. Now, what about mixed models? There, are, there, there does exist, right? It's possible to model a combination of autoregressive and moving average. Um, and again, it's possible to have real life phenomenon that are right, better modeled by a combination than just kind of a pure version of one or the other. For a mixed model, we expect to see a dying down pattern of both SPAC and SAC. Now, realistically, um, it's rare to see complicated mixed models. So if you do think you have a mixed model, the general recommendation is to keep it simple and just do an order one for both of those things and a mix an autoregressive of order one with a moving average of order one. And then this is just what a mixed model looks like. So probably what you would expect, right? So here I, I moved from Z instead of Y, right? The Z notation is kind of is, is saying that, hey, right, this may not be the original observation. I may have had to transform it to get something stationary, but I'm now working with something stationary. And so you can see I have that autoregressive part where Z sub T depends on Z sub T minus one and so forth. I also have, right, the a sub t minus 1 and a sub t minus 2. So, I mean, that's probably how you would imagine you might combine it. Now, what if I look at my SAC and my SPAC and it looks like they're both cutting off? And sadly, I will tell you, in most real life situations, to be honest, even a lot of fake data sets, you look at the SAC and the SPAC, and it looks like they're both cutting off. It turns out that there are no theoretical models in which that happens. So even though your sample version may look like that, it's just like a little bit of noise. And maybe just one's dying down very fast. But the reality is you can't have a model in which SAC and SPAC both cut off. So if it looks like that's what's happening, then, then that just means one is, is dying down quickly. And so what you basically do is you say, okay, of the two, which one seems like it's cutting off the most? Which one is cutting off the most abruptly? I'm going to say that's the one that's cutting off. And then by default, the other one is dying down. Now again, right, always a caveat, um, anytime we do transformations, and we will very often do transformations when we're doing ARIMA modeling, again, it's very rare that your original data set, the original thing that you're modeling is stationary, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So almost always you have to do some type of transforming to get stationarity, which means that you want to reverse those transformations before you do any forecasting. Uh, some closing comments. Uh, a commonly used rule of thumb uh, 
is that at least 50 observations should be observed to use an ARIMA model. So you want at least 50 observations to build a good ARIMA model. Um, I, I think I mentioned that second bullet point already. The success of an ARIMA model is heavily dictated by how well stationarity is achieved. Um, because of that, ARIMA models are not always ideal for complicated trends. That is, right, if you have like a time series, a time series with like a, like a really crazy complex looking pattern, it might be hard to get that stationarity. You might need some other type of modeling. Those types of things where you have very complicated trends. Um, I, I know I just mentioned it super briefly, but um, if you ever run into that situation, maybe Google um, exponential smoothing model. And, and that works well in those types of situations. All right, so uh, this wraps up the lecture. I actually have a supplementary PowerPoint where I walk you through an example, right? I haven't done any examples in here. Um, so so I'm gonna, there's a second PowerPoint for you to go through at some point. Um, it does occur to me, I, I never said um, what the question on our final would be. So um, I don't know, maybe a good question for the final would be something like, um, like what is like the most important thing? Um, what's like the most important assumptions or what's the most important thing that you need to have for an ARIMA model to work well, right? And that would be stationarity. That would be a pretty straightforward uh, question for the final, wouldn't it? All right, uh, let's wrap this thing up and then I'll go ahead and start narrating um, our example.